Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are thrilled to be here today to present this webinar on learning for students with disabilities in the time of COVID-19. Um, today's webinar is sponsored by the ABA Commission on Disability Rights and the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. Um, today's program, we encourage you to ask lots of questions. It's a 90 minute webinar and we have saved about 45 minutes for questions. So we're going to try to provide an overview at the beginning and provide a lot of time for questions because we know that this is a um, confusing time and folks have a lot of questions. Um, in order to ask questions, um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a control panel and there are controls there such so as audio options, chat, raise hand and Q&A. We're going to be using the Q&A, not the chat function. So please um, pay attention to that because I'm new at this too and I'm going to be fielding questions. So it would be helpful if folks could write in their questions in the Q&A box. Um, if you don't see those controls, um, please ensure that your screen is not idle um, so that we can address your questions. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this program um, on the website so that everybody, so that it can be disseminated widely. There are documents that each of the panelists today have provided um, for free for use for all of our participants. They are also on the website. Please note also that there is closed captioning available. Um, it, at the bottom of your screen, once again, you can click on subtitles and that should provide you with the closed captioning. With that, I am thrilled to announce our panelists. My name is Jennifer Gavin. I am an attorney representing parents in special education matters in Brookline, Massachusetts. I have um, been representing kids in special ed cases for about 25 years. I started off at the Children's Law Center of Massachusetts, a nonprofit here um, representing children solely. Um, since then, I've had my own private practice and I focus um, particularly on the needs of teenagers with mental health and comorbid learning disabilities. In addition, we have um, Carlton Walker, Carlton is a parent of a blind child and a certified teacher of blind low vision students. She now heads BEAR, Blindness Education and Advocacy Resources, an education consulting business for parents, attorneys, advocates, and educational providers. Carlton also serves as the president of the National Organization of Parents of Blind Children and the Proud Parent Division of the National Federation of the Blind. Also with us today is Kim Caputo. Kim has been connected to the legal program and aspects of special education for school-age kids for over 20 years. Through her practice with the firm of McAndrews, Mihalik, Connolly, Pulse, and Ryan, she represents parents and caregivers across the southeastern portion of Pennsylvania, handling all aspects of special education cases. Prior to joining the firm, Kim represented a large urban school district where she also held leadership administrative level positions. She's an active board member with Disability Rights Pennsylvania and a member of the Pennsylvania Bar Association Education and Civil Rights Committee. And also with us today is Celine Almazan. Celine is the legal director of the Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys. Um, I hope you are all aware of COPA. It is the largest organization in the United States for um, parent side attorneys. If you are not aware of it, please um, click on Celine's um, links so that you can check out COPA and become a member. She has been a practicing attorney for over 30 years. She continues to represent parents in Maryland in special education cases in addition to her work at COPA. So we're going to be starting today um, by um, breaking our discussion up into three sections. The first section will be the current law and what is the current law in the time of COVID-19? Do special education students have any rights? Secondly, 
we'll be discussing what the challenges are at this time. What are some barriers that have been put up for families? And um, how dangerous are those barriers? And our third section today will be on strategies moving forward. What can we do to help our clients so that as we move forward, students can get the best education possible? Okay, and with that, I am going to start with Celine. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you all are. Um, thank you for this opportunity um, to do this presentation. Uh, COPA has been um, providing resources for families um, since the beginning of the um, closures of schools, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, and we have a lot of resources on our website at www.copaa.org. Um, I'm going to start talking today about the current law and about where um, COPA believes the, the current policies are. Um, and um, we have to start with the um, release from the Office of Special Education Programs, OSEP, the U United States Department of Education, issued guidance on March 12, 2020 about school closures. And in that March 12th guidance to the states said that if school districts were not going to be opening and or offering um, education to the general education population, children who were attending school, they had no obligation to provide education to children with disability. This was a grand and huge departure from their previous guidance to schools, specifically the, um, their guidance to schools in 2014 during the Ebola um, outbreak and, um, and their 2016 guidance on charter schools when charter schools um, go bankrupt or are no longer no longer able to um, operate a charter school system that um, um, in 2016 the same Department of Education said children with disabilities are still supposed to get an education during that time so um, four years later um, we have during I realize an unprecedented pa um, pandemic a policy change by our US Department of Education telling school districts um, not offering school to anybody, you don't have to offer an education to children with disabilities. Um, at the time, uh, some school districts said, okay, um, since we don't have to offer education to anyone, we don't have to offer education to children with disabilities. Um, and this caused widespread confusion. Um, some school districts stepped up and started offering distance learning pretty immediately. Um, other school districts issued statements saying they're not going to be offering any education for any child um, and that, therefore they don't have to offer education for children with disabilities, whether they're covered under an IEP or Section 504. In 2000, and then on March 21st, 2020, um, the department issued another guidance to try to clear it up. Um, and basically said, um, we didn't mean um, that you didn't have to offer education to children um, with disabilities. Um, that's not really what we meant. We, you do need to offer you know, education for children with disabilities if you're offering education to everyone. Still did not um, um, step back on their policy position change, um, which as I said was dramatic, um, but um, um, did say unequ unequivocally to states um, and school districts, you need to start offering education to children with disabilities. So this is you know, where we are. The, the US Department of Education thus far has issued three guidances that on March 12th, March 16th, and March 21st. Um, um, there are school districts that um, are not offering education to anyone in their, school, um, in their school system, which I think is dangerous um, because the obligation to provide a free appropriate public education remains. Um, the United States Supreme Court um, decision in Andrew F. remains good law um, and children need to be getting um, an education, whether it's through distance learning um, or whatever you want to call it, um, they should be getting those kinds of services to the extent that it can be done. Um, certainly COPA recognizes that it is an unprecedented time. Um, we are encouraging families to work with school districts 
Um, on behalf of my clients, I have um, uh, participated in distance learning meetings, um, you know, up to 20 people on Zoom, um, and it has worked um, fine. Um, and students are getting um, some programming. Thank you, Celine. Um, and now, Kim Caputo. Hi, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for logging in and participating. It's a real privilege to be part of this panel, uh, and I look forward to answering some questions. Celine did a great job um, with the framework of the law. I just have a couple add-ons. Um, where I practice predominantly is in southeastern Pennsylvania, where I'm happy to share out that the vast majority of local educational agents, LEAs, are in fact, at least at this point in time, um, working hard to engage with parents and come up with educational continuity plans. Similarly, in this part of the state, um, there are a significant number of charters. Uh, in Pennsylvania, charters are their own local educational agents. That is different uh, across the country. Um, but again, in PA, those charters uh, function as their own local educational agent. And I also am happy to share that at least in and around the Philadelphia area, many of those charters are also working hard to come up with plans and systems to continue to engage and connect with students. Um, that being said, this is, a, this is unprecedented. It is challenging. It is challenging across the board for everyone. Parents who are now home struggling with work demands or financial demands now being asked to connect um, remotely in quasi-teacher roles, families with multiple children across multiple grades. Um, on the flip side, there are teachers who now are also at home perhaps helping their own children and also trying to work with students. So the law doesn't talk about this, but it is absolutely an undercurrent in everything that I have read and seen, flexibility and reasonableness. Everyone has to just kind of take a breath and take a pause and look at individual children, certainly, certainly. As Celine said, Andrew F. is the law. Students with IEPs, despite the fact that these times are unprecedented, have individual needs, and those individual needs do not get suspended. They do not evaporate because these times are so unprecedented. If a school and a parent can at least communicate with one another about those needs and try to craft an educational continuity response in this time, then I think that that is an absolutely great first step. Um, parents should not forget, nor should LEAs forget, that right before schools closed, there were a cohort of students covered under Section 504. Those are students who have a disability, but they do not require or did not require specially designed instruction. They required, however, accommodations and modifications to the general education curriculum and the specific grade standard. Many of those accommodations may not be applicable now if the continuity plan focuses on one-on-one -on -one instruction or online learning. However, some of those accommodations may become even more vital and more important. So looking again, at the student, at his or her individual needs as they existed right before school closed. And now that we are in a completely different environment, how do those needs change and what supports would be necessary given the new environment? Evaluations, IEP meetings, all of these things are still supposed to be happening. What they look like, however, is probably going to be very different. In Pennsylvania, um, the Association of School Psychologists has put together a document that they have asked that the Pennsylvania Department of Education embrace, speaking to the idea that uh, evaluations should be suspended to the extent that they require face-to-face -face assessment of a child. Obviously, 
evaluations that require observation of a child in a learning environment, that aspect of an evaluation is going to be very difficult, if even possible, to be accomplished during this time frame because children are not in the typical school environment. Having said that, however, it is problematic particularly from a parent perspective, but I would also submit from a school district perspective it, uh, to accept the belief that we are just gonna sit and pause and wait until September. No good can come from that in my way of thinking because come September, God willing, schools will be back open and we will be ready to just engage and begin learning. But there will be an entire cohort of brand new children who have needs and who have who require access to a psychologist for assessment. And so, again, communication and flexibility between the LEA and a parent to talk about, well, listen, how can we get some information about my child who's already in an educational system now during the closure so that when we reopen, my child is not part of what's going to be a growing cohort of children who need to be evaluated and assessed. Um, in Pennsylvania, heaven forbid, if LEAs and parents reach an impasse and they require a dispute resolution, those tools and mechanisms remain alive and well during this time. Again, what it looks like will be very different. Most hearing officers or the adjudicators of these disputes are convening um, video hearing sessions. And that's gonna take a little bit of extra creativity and effort on the part of attorneys and on the part of their respective clients in terms of preparation and how the matter should move forward. Um, my last set of remarks speaks to that area of the law uh, under IDEA that deals with transition. And when I think about transition, I think about it in a couple different ways. I think about it in terms of the really young students who are in preschool and receiving supports and for whom kindergarten would begin in September 2020. Those students typically are connecting with the school age local educational agent now in the spring of 2020. So if you are a parent and you, and you find yourself in that category, you're gonna have some concerns in terms of, or you should have some concerns in terms of your child's transition from the preschool sections of IDEA into the school age sections. Fast forward all the way up to high school, right before the closure, there were a cohort of students sitting in 12th grade or perhaps getting ready to exit out of IDEA. Maybe that's a different kind of conversation now given the changed circumstance. So those types of parents might want to take a minute, take a pause and rethink, hey, were our post-secondary changes, our goal, our plan as of January, 2020, is that the same plan we wanna to stick to now given the circumstance? And IDEA certainly allows for changed circumstances and teams and parents to connect and converse around what now should happen. So I look forward to getting your questions and um, thank you again. Thank you, Kim. Carlton, could you add to that please? Absolutely. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I come from three different worlds. Attorney, then as parent of a blind child, child with significant disabilities, multiple actually, and um, then a teacher of blind students. I, so in, in the trenches, I found that a lot of times schools don't necessarily follow the great guidance that Celine and Kim have set forth. USDOE, even the new guidance that, uh, any, if you offer, if the school offers educational opportunities, then it must offer faith in special education. Well, schools, I'm sure people know, are trying to say, oh, well, we're just offering enrichment. These are voluntary worksheets and trying to wiggle out of really clear guidance, even the more restrictive recent guidance, more restrictive than 2014, 2016. Uh, to add to, in sharing with the USDOE guidance, doesn't necessarily 
open minds and hearts. I have found that in other regards too, sometimes sharing the state DOE recommendations is really helpful. Uh, the schools are more, have a close relationship with their state DOE and they are more closely monitored and supervised by their state DOE. So I think that that helps too. Uh, the National Federation of the Blind has collected a, um, all of the state guidance to date for each of the 50 states. And I will leave District of Columbia, I'm not sure about Puerto Rico, I should have checked. And you can find that at www.nfb.org um, slash resources slash COVID-19. Um, you can also just go to the search engine and type in COVID-19. Uh, that is a really great resource. You'll find in that resource that not unlike other times with um, federal regulations, some states are not following USDOE guidance. They are giving more little loopholes out. It's unfortunate. It's something that needs to be addressed, but you are better prepared when you know what your school districts are getting from your state department of education. Um, also, very unfortunately, several of these, the, this guidance mentions federal waivers. And, and it's, it's very discouraging to see educators thinking more about how to get out of educating children than thinking about how to educate children. But again, um, being forewarned is, for, forewarned is being forearmed. So I really encourage you to seek out those resources too. Obviously, federal resource um, wins in any um, co conflict with states, but it's good to know what your districts are hearing as well. Thank you, Carlton. Um, the only thing that I would wanna add to this topic of what the current law is, is a question that I've been getting a lot is, is my child's IEP still um, effective? And what are these remote learning plans? Does that um, supersede my child's IEP? Is that an IEP amendment? Um, what does happen to the IEP? Anyone? Well, um, in the guidance, the 2014 and 2016 guidance, um, the department at that time talked about holding IEP meetings. And so initially, um, I thought that we would be holding IEP meetings. Um, I've come to the realization that um, we need to leave the IEPs alone because the IEPs are frozen in time from when schools closed and that IEP remains in effect when school is going to reopen. I mean, certainly what we're going to have to do is um, look at where children are and their present levels of performance, where they were when it school closed and now where they are when school is going to reopen um, and talk about how we're going to bring children back up to where they were when school when schools closed um, so in so in shorthand the IEP is still there yes um, the IEP is still your child's contract with your school district as to what they should be receiving um, but for the issues of um, protecting the health of the students and the health of the providers. Um, right. Can I just jump you. in? Yes, please. I, I would just add that I have seen, uh, although these are much smaller educational providers, single charter schools um, are the example. The IEP at a school level, so for example, the day before the closure remains, and as Celine indicated, frozen. Those schools, and I think that this is predominantly a function of their size, have reached out to parents to craft interim IEPs to deal with the fact that what was offered in the school setting looked a certain way and was a certain thing, and now they are trying to offer something different given the changed circumstances. I can't say I have seen that extensively, um, I've also seen, um, much like Celine, districts reaching out to parents, asking to convene meetings, Google, Zoom, some sort of electronic platform to review and discuss how best to move forward uh, given the changed circumstance. But 
I fully agree with what everyone else has said that looking at that IEP, the IEP that was in place the day before the schools closed, that should be the document that defines a child's present levels. And then what those present levels are come September or October, I think is where the meaty, meaty, like the food, conversation mm -hmm. is going to happen because it is everybody's hope. And, and my remarks are based in fact, but they are also somewhat aspirational. I, I am hoping that, you know, in this time, everybody can work productively and collectively. Uh, and, but, but that, um, I just lost my train of thought. I lost my train of thought on this. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> I, I would like to add just a little bit. Um, we might, at risk of leading into the next topic a teeny bit, I, I have seen schools, and actually very wealthy schools, make statements like, we will offer no more than one week of special ed per, one hour per week of special ed, no matter what your child's disability or disabilities are. That's just, a, and there are multiple school districts threatening to withhold any supports, any services, any accommodations, any modifications, any assistive technology, unless parents essentially sign away their children's IEP rights. That's completely, not only is it, uneth is it unethical, I think it could, I, I would fight it in court if a parent did go down that road, but uh, it, it, it's, it's terrible. And the other thing we have to remember is IEPs are not so kids get something and schools have to provide something. They're for what the student needs. And we develop them for a purpose. And COVID-19 notwithstanding, the child likely still needs those things. Mm -hmm. So the child cannot, we can't just say, oh, well, it wasn't easy to provide, so eh, we're not gonna do it, or we're not gonna do it till fall. We must keep, for, first and foremost in our minds, the child's needs now and what the child needs to be able to go back to school in the fall. We need to have that child prepared, not six months behind. Thank you, Carlton. That's a really important point. Um, the point that I wanted to make was to bring together um, Carlton's statements about the states and what guidance they are providing with local districts um, and how important that is that I'm seeing on this issue of what happens with the IEP um, and whether or not there's a remote learning plan is what they're calling them here in Massachusetts is being provided. You know, our state um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided a sample remote learning plan to districts to encourage them to really spell out what the um, services are that they're going to provide. They say repeatedly um, on uh, all of their documents, this will not look like the service delivery grid in your IEP. Um, this is based on what we can provide while, while still protecting the health of the providers and the child. And then oftentimes the word feasible is thrown in as well. Um, so I have um, encouraged the families that I work with to really to jump on that remote learning plan. And if your state doesn't have a um, remote learning plan or distance learning plan that they are proposing, contact your child's school and say, you know, what is it that you are planning to provide so that my child can continue to make progress on the goals of his or her IEP? Um, so that leads us into what Carlton was saying um, regarding some of the um, horror stories is probably the, the best thing I can come up with. Um, the misinformation that is out there that is lowering the standards for education for students with disabilities. Um, I'd like to start by going back to Celine. Um, I didn't mean to catch you off guard there, Celine, without your glasses on. Um, <laughs> Could you, could you provide us some um, mis what you've heard regarding misinformation and what the dangers of that are? Sure. So um, what, what we're hearing um, from families and what we've seen um, in writing from some um, school, major school administrator uh, groups um, is that FAPE is different. FAPE does not apply. There's been some sort of pause um, during a pandemic of FAPE, which is inaccurate. That the Andrew F. standard, where Justice Roberts um, talked about um, uh, uh, 
a, a child circumstances as a part of the definition to how you um, determine whether or not a child is getting a free appropriate um, public education, that this circumstances could it is the pandemic. And so we've got an altered circumstance. So therefore the FAPE standard is lower. That is incorrect. Um, I actually, I just heard that as recently as last Friday uh, on a webinar. Um, that is incorrect. Um, when Chief Justice Roberts was talking about child circumstances, they were not talking about the pandemic. They were talking about a child's abilities um, and needs um, that they present to a school and how a school um, uh, addresses those. So that is a danger. Um, we've also heard anecdotally from families that they are asked, being asked to sign a waiver of their rights to challenge um, um, the provision of FAPE during this time, um, um, that they're being asked to waive those rights, um, that they're being asked to waive um, any kind of ability to, to say that they want something different, um, that they do not agree to the distance learning plan, then therefore um, they have to, you know, they're not going to get anything. Um, I think that the, actually the whole theme is that these absolutes are absolutely inappropriate. Um, and that's when school districts can get into some trouble. You can't say no one is going to get occupational therapy during the school closure. IEP, individualized, it has to be tailored to what that student needs. Um, so when school districts say no one is going to be getting occupational therapy during school closure, you're not meeting each individual student's needs. Now, I'm not an occupational therapist, but I've had a few meetings with clients and I know that there are occupational therapists who are doing therapy remotely. Um, three days into um, um, statewide closures, I spoke with an attorney down in um, Kentucky who was already getting services, who was already getting occupational therapy services, visits remotely by the special educator. So it can all be done. Um, um, the other thing that we're hearing is that there's gonna be no extended school year. Mm, no, that's also incorrect. Um, that has to be an individualized determination for students. Um, so, Things like that that are absolutes are, are inappropriate. Um, the issue of compensatory services, uh, we are all talking about compensatory services. Um, I'd like to propose that we look at it a little differently. Um, compensatory services means that the school district has done something wrong, that they have failed um, to um, provide a student with something that the student was entitled to. Um, the school closures are no one's fault, except for the virus, right? Um, so perhaps we can start looking at what are the services that a child is gonna need when schools reopen to bring them back to where they were, to Kim's point, to where they were the day before schools closed. We're gonna have to look at what IEPs, what, we're gonna have to look at, at present levels of performance for students when schools reopen. But let's start talking about what are those services that are needed? Um, perhaps instead of calling it compensatory services, because that has a sort of us versus them kind of connotation because it is something that schools failed to do. Um, so I think we need to start looking at services um, and um, start looking at what are students going to need. To Kim's point, Carlton's point, um, they're going to have those needs when schools start, and they may be even more um, profound um, at you know when schools start back up. Um, I agree with you, Celine. Um, the question of compensatory services is one that has gotten a lot of talk, yeah. and the way that I have begun to think about it, that I that I'm hoping will be helpful is simply a reassessment of the child when schools reopen and how exactly. have their needs changed. Their needs are likely are not the same as they were on the last day um, prior to the closure. Their needs have probably increased and mm -hmm. so it's a matter of changing their plan prospectively right. to address right. those increased needs as right. opposed right. to a compensatory services going back. Right. Um, right. 
Yeah. Additionally, though, we especially if the regular, if non-disabled students are getting instruction, not either enrichment or new instruction, they are going getting ahead of our kids mm -hmm. with disabilities mm -hmm. who have for for whom IEP services have not been provided. So we have to not only look at where the child is, but also look where the child should have been mm -hmm. and where the non-disabled children were allowed to get. Right. Good point. Thank you. Um, Carlton, do you have more to provide think, this time? Uh, sure. Oh, I'm, I supposed to, I'm sorry, I was yeah. supposed to go to Kim next. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for that, that, that look on your face. That was helpful. <laughs> Kim, your turn. Um, so danger, danger signs. It's, it's, it's the same now on some level as it was before the closure. When either participant in this conversation around a child, a parent and the LEA collectively, when they are in a place of no, not ever, not, those negative definitives are the same and the reaction should be the same. Um, so if an individual is finding themselves in that type of environment, then I would suggest that should be kind of a red flag. Um, the, the, I have not seen this frequently, but I have seen it. This idea that, um, and Celine mentioned it under Andrew F, that somehow the pandemic is the unique circumstance. Mm -hmm. And that gets scaffolded with the pandemic is a unique circumstance and regular education, the collective whole, is being adversely impacted and is not able to fill in the blank, receive instruction. And then that, that equation, pandemic is a unique circumstance, uh, compromise to the collective whole is used by an LEA as a justification not to individualize. And that is just a wrong equation. It's a misapplication of Andrew F, as Celine suggested, and it's, it completely sacrifices the individualization, the I in the IDEA. It's not to say that every single IEP service is going to be replicated exactly in this time of pandemic, but that doesn't mean that we throw the baby out with the proverbial bathwater. That individualization still has to happen, and that individualization is tied to the child, not to the pandemic. Um, the only other danger kind of warning, Will Robinson, for those participants who are old enough to remember Lost in Space, <laughs> anything that is signing, if you are so being asked to sign to waive, if you are being asked to sign to give up, and heaven forbid, if you are being asked to sign to exit, to exit from service. And I say this with an underscore to those parents who have students who are in the 12th grade or who are approaching age 21 and for whom exit from service was discussed or contemplated in that IEP the day before the closure. Those for me would be warning, um, warning signs to maybe take a pause, seek some advice from family member, advocate, attorney um, before you affix your John Hancock. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Now, Carlton. <laughs> I just want to run over some things. We've seen scapegoating of students with disabilities with widespread education or claims from school officials that no education can be provided because we can't meet those IEPs. No. Kids with disabilities aren't to blame. This backlash is, has, has a lot of negative impact. Uh, we are hearing utilitarian arguments, the greatest good for the greatest number. Mm -hmm. That type of thing is going to set our equitable education civil rights back more than a quarter of a century. We can't, we can't go there. Uh, I'm seeing parents accepting the school's claims. Oh, well, of course you can't give physical therapy via teletherapy, except physical therapists have been doing it for years and years and years in the medical, in, with adults. So it's hard for me to accept that it can't be done when people are doing it, like, like Kim and Celine have um, talked about. Uh, and unfortunately, I believe that these types of um, 
absolute statements are engendering feelings of helplessness in educators. They're buying into it too. Oh, well, yeah, I guess I, I can't do it. We're abandoning rational thought. We're focusing on the how. Well, I've always passed out worksheets to somebody, so I don't know what I could do. Maybe give them a paper packet. No, we need to focus on the why. Why did you give that worksheet to those children? Was it to keep them from tearing the school apart while you had to go to the bathroom? Okay, that's fair. As an educator, I get that, but that's probably not something we need to really keep because somebody else is taking care of the children. Um, but what is the purpose? Let's see if we can have some creative ways of having the social interaction and the learning, meeting those standards that the child needs. For a child, for instance, needing to learn Braille or sign language, making sure that the child progresses so that come fall, they're not another school year behind their peers. Um, again, focus on edu education rather than, uh, we're, we're fit, I hear some focus on educators rather than students too. Uh, just yesterday I was reading an article in Baltimore talking about how it's tough for the teachers who have children to actually to teach their students. Well, you know what? It's tough for nurses who have children or it, and it's tough for a computer programmer who has children to do the online education and his or her job also. Let's think outside the box. We don't need to be confined to eight to three school hours because we're not in the building anymore. It might be best, easier for some teachers to uh, have a social studies class at seven o'clock in the evening because they, they might have a, another caregiver for their children. Let's think outside the box and not be so wedded to what we used to do and embrace this opportunity. We didn't ask for this pandemic. We did not ask for school closures, but this is where we are. So let's embrace it and look and see if we can find some silver linings. Thank you. Um, one anecdote that I wanted to share from, from my experience is in um, watching a um, Zoom of a local school committee meeting um, a couple of weeks ago the special education director informed the school committee that the town was not going to be providing any speech and language therapy because um, the speech language therapist in her school district had informed her that due to licensing requirements, um, they couldn't do it um, over Zoom. Um, and I thought, well, that's unusual. What, what does that mean? And um, doing a, just a little bit of research, just a little bit of a, a, a Google search, um, came upon the licensing requirements um, of my state, which yes, for telepractice, as they call it for speech language therapy, been around a long time, um, but there are licensing requirements that say that before engaging in telepractice, speech language pathologists had to go through 10 hours of training before they could provide that service. Um, interestingly, however, just days after the school closure in my state, the licensing board had changed their <laughs> requirements and had waived the 10 hours of training necessary in order to provide telepractice. Um, so there was no barrier to providing speech language services. So I think that it's really important, um, what that taught me is to think about um, when you're told, no, it can't happen, um, why is that? Why can't it happen? Um, you know, the question of whether or not something is feasible. Well, it's not feasible because why? Um, because there's not enough staff, the staff isn't trained appropriately. You know, what is it that is the barrier that we can um, work on? Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention is in thinking about what services can be provided, I like to look at the objectives in the IEP. Um, and really that's what I'm thinking will guide me as to what this child needs. Where are we trying to get to? Um, it's not the exact service in the service delivery grid that we need to provide, but how are we going to make progress towards those objectives? Okay. Um, we are now on to our third section. Of course, we are a little bit behind, um, so we can go through this fairly quickly, and we do have lots of questions. Um, looks like 83. Um, so <laughs> um, let, let's get through this next section. The next section is what are the steps that we can take to protect the rights of special needs students at this time? So how can we be proactive? 
Celine, would you like to take that first? Sure. Um, I'll leave it over to Kim and Carlton. Um, so several things on our on our um, COVID-19 webpage um, has uh, links for resources for distance learning. Um, um, we have been telling families to um, videotape their children um, using their telephone um, of the skills that they have or, you know, uh, immediately after closure, where they are now to try to document what kind of um, academic or any other kind of skill loss there may be. Um, you could have the sample work that was coming home from school um, at the beginning of March as a benchmark, perhaps, um, and then some of the work that they're doing now. Um, uh, we're um, also thinking, of, we've done a webinar um, for families and attorneys and advocates a couple of weeks ago. We're going to be doing another one. We're doing this one. I've done one with uh, National Down Syndrome Congress. Um, and another one with the autism group in Florida this, this coming Friday. Um, just, uh, we are constantly updating the website on new resources. Um, there are links on the website for where your school districts are, what, they, what your um, State Department of Education has put out. Um, our local chapter of Decoding Dyslexia in Maryland has done an awesome job of taking every local school district um, learning plan um, and plans and putting it up on, uh, on their website. So that's been very helpful for those of us who represent families in more than one uh, school district here. At least we know what other school, you know, what they're saying if you're not doing a lot of work there, but happen to have one single client in one um, jurisdiction. There's 24 jurisdictions in Maryland. Um, so I, we are in uncharted ter territory, and I know I keep on saying that, um, don't have all of the answers. I'm still trying to figure out the evaluation piece, um, um, you know, looking at what kind of data schools might have had before, um, for an initial evaluation, um, and, you know, determining whether or not that can still go forward for eligibility. Um, so that's, that's what I've got uh, about going forward. I know that Carlton and Kim had had much more than I did. Thank you, Celine. Um, and I'm uh, going to correctly go to Kim next. Sure, sure. So first, everybody on this call, whether you are a principal, a teacher, a parent, a foster parent, a grandparent, an older sister, take care of you. Take care of you. This is not uh, a sprint. It never was a sprint. Educating children with differences is never a sprint. It's always a marathon, and even more acutely so now. Um, I agree with all of my colleagues. Try and find a silver lining. It may sound kind of Pollyanna-ish, um, because I do, I fully, fully realize that there are challenges, but everybody needs to stay sane um, because children watch adults. They watch all of the adults and they are very connected emotionally um, and socially to how the adults around them are reacting and responding, which gets me to my point. Learning in this time, um, whether it is through packets, whether it is through online learning, is a new format. There will be children who respond very favorably to it, and that's great. However, one of the reasons those groups of children may be responding favorably to it is because the stressor that brick and mortar school mm -hmm. represents is now removed. And that, that stressor in and of itself is going to be returning come September um, and the fall. And so this idea this notion of how does the child present now, certainly in terms of academics, which that frozen in time IEP will be helpful. Certainly in terms of very specific related service needs, that IEP frozen in time will be helpful. But there may be some unintended consequences. The unintended consequence of being removed from the brick and mortar school, being removed from that very structured routine, being removed from that place that in and of itself may have been a stressor. And 
and the increase in screen time and electronic learning. That this, it's unavoidable and it's not about finger pointing or blame. It's just a reality that I would hope educators and parents together would recognize and it's not gonna to apply to every child, but it will apply to some. So that's something, I, I see it as solution and I'm putting it in the solution category because I think that if we are thinking about these issues now, we can be addressing them. And the more robust the program is, I mean, perfection should not be our enemy right now. People should not be afraid to try because they are afraid of liability. Try for the kid, be creative. And it's all gonna be assessed once schools resume, resume. Hopefully, there will be positive impacts, in which case additional services might not be necessary, or additional services might be necessary that were otherwise not necessary once that IEP was frozen in time because of what has happened in the two, three, and four months that instruction has looked so different. Um, access resources. I've been on the COPA webpage a number of times. It's great. There's tremendous amount of information published out there for parents and educators. Access it. and come to the table with questions and suggestions. Do not be afraid to throw something out as a suggestion um, because it might be a key for an individual child. Thank you, Kim. Yep. Yep. Comments? Yes, I, I echo um, what Celine is saying about documenting present. As, and if you didn't do it in March, fabulous. It's not a problem, do it now, it's okay. Um, and actually to the, um, Kim's point of taking care of yourself, Keeping a journal, a diary, especially when there are frustrations, can be really helpful. It can be helpful to vent on, uh, on the computer, on, on, on paper, uh, but then it also gives you some good information for reflecting back in future months. Um, Kim's point about children perhaps doing better outside the school environment is really important data. If we are seeing that it wasn't the educational information, but it was the school environment that um, caused some trouble. That helps um, the team determine what other supports might need to be replaced. How might we need to change things? And Kim talked about other resources, and I cannot agree more. Um, on the website is a lot of the educational resources being provided are sadly not accessible to students who are blind or have low vision. So I've created a document of things that are accessible and everything on that document's free. So whoot, there are other things that aren't free, but everything there is free. Um, but document those things too. Document your enrichment. If you're going around the house and weeding the garden every day, which is, I wish I were, <laughs> um, document that. That may be good information for your IEP team when you come back. Uh, if you are providing Braille, in, or if you have volunteers providing Braille instruction for the child that the school isn't providing, or the school's providing very little, you want to document that, okay, yeah, the school gave us half an hour a week, but we got another five hours a week from the outside. Because otherwise the school will come back and oh my gosh, she's learned so much, only half an hour a week, we can, <laughs> it, we, we need to know what we're actually talking about. And that's what the documentation is all about. And find allies. There are some great allies out there disability specific, and also just educational allies. Again, taking care of yourself um, is the number one in Thank your you, child. Thank you, um, I had just a couple of comments that I wanted to add regarding um, baseline. Now, where are, are we at for baseline when we're moving forward? And fortunately here in Massachusetts, the second quarter of the school year ended um, in the end of January, and those progress reports were issued in February. So we should have, um, at least here, it, it, you know, certainly by weeks it would vary um, throughout the country, but hopefully there are mid-year progress reports on the goals of the IEP that should provide data as to where your child was at that point midway through the school year. I think that that is really important. Um, the other piece is 
regarding documentation. And everyone has said, document, document, document. And um, I've attached to the website a form that um, I developed and are giving to my clients to just ask some specific questions is to, to guide people in documenting. Um, it's what are, look at that mid-year report card. What are the objectives? Where was your child at that time? And then keep a record not only of what they are being provided, is it a live session with the special education teacher? Is it packets that they're receiving? So different kinds of you know, teacher-directed learning versus student-directed learning. Keep track of how they're doing it, how much time is being provided, and then look at those objectives. Were any of those objectives worked on during that time? If you could just keep track of you know, goals one through four, and here's the four objectives under each goal, and you know, maybe the teacher is focusing on you know, one objective um, under goal two, because that's similar for a lot of students. Um, so they may be focusing on that and missing out on a couple of the other objectives. So I've been asking families to keep track that way. In addition, Carlton, as you said, keep track of what other private services that you may be bringing in to help your student. Um, but I've also suggested to um, my clients to inform the school district that you are providing services um, through privately because your child isn't getting them through the school um, and is not making progress because not receiving those services. Um, and you know, just it's like a unilateral placement letter. You know, send them a letter and say, well, I've had to provide these services and I will be asking for reimbursement um, when school reopens. Now, whether we ever get to that point, I don't know. Um, and it's not likely that we'll be talking in those terms, but I want the school to know um, what are the resources that families are spending on providing services like speech and language services when the school district says they can't provide it because it's a violation of licensing. So <laughs> I'll go back to that one. And, and to add on to that, um, assistive technology is mm. such a big thing. I've heard from parents who their children only communicate by switches and there were no switches at home before closures. That's mind boggling it. That, that, that was wrong to begin with. But some schools might double down and not say, oh, well, you don't, obviously don't need it because we didn't provide it earlier when we should have. We don't want to get into a blaming situation. We don't have a time machine, can't go back. Let's move forward. And if you can get the school to get the tech out of the school building, and if not, certainly document any other way you've gotten to borrow or purchase it. And you know, the basic laptop or Chromebooks as they use here in Massachusetts, who are the students that don't have one? If the teacher is mm -hmm. providing some sort of online services to her class, mm -hmm. but your client doesn't have access to the one laptop at home with four different brothers and sisters or whatever the situation may be. Um, I'm working with a client who is in a group home and the group home had one laptop for nine students. Um, and I asked the school district to please provide a laptop. And their first response was, oh no, we're not providing laptops. <laughs> hmm. um, so we talked about it a bit. And fortunately in the end, um, they agreed. They said, okay, well, we'll put in a new order for Chromebooks, but they're not gonna come in for six weeks. Um, I said, well, that's really too long. I can get one on Amazon and have it delivered in by the middle of next week. It's $232. Will you agree to reimburse me? Yes. Um, so it was just being creative. How are we going to do this? Does your child really need to wait on um, that six weeks? All right. Uh, let's get to our 98 questions now. <laughs> I do want to get to, well, I'll pull that up after we talk about this first one. All right. The one that seems to have come to the top at this point is, is there any legislation or future plans for legislation addressing compensatory education in your states? Uh, I'll address it in Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, there is no specific 
uh, legislation in chapter 14 pertaining to compensatory education. And in fact, interestingly enough, um, on the federal side in IDEA and its regulations, compensatory education is not specifically defined. It's, it's been created uh, through various pieces of litigation, administrative and otherwise, as a remedy for students. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that that will change as a result of the pandemic. It seems that that, uh, that legislators in Pennsylvania, and, and I don't want to speak on the federal side of it, but they are more inclined to be comfortable with how administrative hearing officers who hear each of these cases and all of their individual nuances uh, come up with an appropriate remedy for a child, one of which is compensatory education, but that's not the only one. So I, my gut tells me that that will not change. Mm -hmm. One thing we may want to raise, though, are what are the um, potential for federal waivers? Um, well, and how um, will that change our landscape? Yeah, I, the Secretary of Education needs congressional authority to waive timelines. Um, the department does not have the authority to do so, and that's in the letter to Gary um, after Hurricane Sandy. Um, you know, there have been other letters from the department to specific questions upon natural disasters like hurricanes. Um, Louisiana and New York come to mind as most recent. Um, and so there is no authority to do that. You do need the federal government to the Congress to, to create that waiver. Um, COPA has been sending out alerts um, saying no waivers. Um, we are, we believe that there's flexibility already in IDEA. Um, you've all, always had flexibility since 2004 to have um, IEP meetings by phone. So some of that early resistance um, was futile. Um, that, you know, there was always that the ability <laughs> to do that. Um, you can agree to waive the due process 45 day timeline. Um, it doesn't have to be completed soup to nuts. In the 45 days, it's often impossible in many areas of the country to do that. Um, and there's always been some flexibility on, um, on uh, um, oh, now I, I caught Kim's. Uh oh. Yeah, um, the you know the some some of the timelines on the evaluations, um, you know, parents can agree to some of those things. Um, it doesn't mean that the district is held um, um, no fault, um, but you know, there's always been some flexibility for people, parents, and schools to to agree. So we believe that there is flexibility in the IDEA already. Um, we don't think that there should be waivers, certainly not the 45 school day waiver that some of the groups are asking for. That's nine weeks into a school year, um, which is a long time in the, in the lifetime of a, of a student's education. Thank you. Uh, and with regard to accommodations and modifications, I know that I'm, I'm concerned <laughs> that there may be waivers beyond the procedural and the timelines. Uh, I, I just really encourage everybody to think about what was being done before schools closed. Yeah. Certainly, there were processes in place. There were staff in place. There were procedures in place. Those did not explode when schools closed. We, it, it's a new world, but it's not that new. Uh, so before we try, before schools try to say that, oh, well, we can't do that now because the building's closed, well, Let's think through and put our creative hats on and see if we could make it work like we did two months ago. Uh, here's another question um, that I thought was would be helpful for folks to hear the answer to. Should school districts be responsible for providing, for instance, mailing adaptive materials, for example, tactile alphabets, puzzles, etc., to students who are home due to the school closures? If needed for faith. Sure. <laughs> and if needed also for um, blind students don't get the same kind of opportunities for incidental learning that sighted students do. And there, there's some braille, but it's usually fairly high for short people. It's really hard to reach. Good education, it, we know we envelop children in literacy. This is, if, 
and, and blind students need that um, literacy incidentally as well. So I would say, I don't, I don't see an educational purpose for withholding it. Let's put it that way. That brings up for me um, issues regarding um, children with autism mm -hmm. and uh, their communication devices, whether they use a, communica a communication board mm -hmm. at, at school or whether they um, use an iPad um, at school. Fortunately, you know, it should have been that they had those materials at home too prior to the school closure because that then helps them to generalize their skills learned in school to the home and community. But in some cases, schools weren't at that point where they were actually providing those services to generalize skills. Mm -hmm. And now we have a child home without their communication devices uh, and how we're gonna get those to the students. I would make a strong argument to contact the special education director right away. Mm -hmm. um, and get those materials. And if they can't provide them, and, you know, is there another way to get the iPad with the software on it? What can you do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so facile with this. Uh, do you have thoughts about students with disabilities in juvenile facilities and their rights under IDEA? We are hearing pushback by the city agency holding them in custody that they don't have adequate technology with adequate security and from the LEA, LEA that they can't be held to the same standard as other students in the city because the students are in a correctional setting. Clearly there are arguments and ways to push back on this, but there are also practical and legal hurdles. Thoughts on navigating these competing interests. I always focus on the student. Uh, the student has special has needs for a reason. It, mm -hmm. Again, it's not it's it's not a cherry on the ice cream sundae. It's it's needed. Uh, we can talk about hot spots. We can talk about other types of technology. I mean, I think most prisons have electrical outlets. Uh, we just need to focus on what what does the student need and why does the student need it and is there a really educational, is there an educational basis for saying, oh no, it's really not needed? Yeah, why does the student need it to, for, to work on those objectives in his or her IEP? And how can we do that during this time of closure while keeping folks safe? Right. Um, unfortunately, here in Massachusetts, the services that are often provided in these institutional settings, um, like a um, juvenile facility, or a um, psychiatric hospital um, are often not the focus of the child's care at that time um, and therefore are often under-resourced. So I can see this question coming up. Um, we don't have the, the laptops, the whatever this child needs in order to do this. And I think it just takes that creative thinking mm -hmm. as to how we can address it. Next. So some schools are saying they can't do any classes over the internet due to FERPA and, and that it would violate FERPA. Could you discuss that, please? Uh, I have seen, uh, I have not seen the no, meaning we won't do because of issues with uh, potential privacy issues with online. I have seen districts issuing letters explaining to parents that we are using Google Classroom, that we are going to work very hard and we've worked with our IT department to take as many steps as possible to ensure privacy protections are in place, but they are in fact being, in my opinion, relatively transparent with families that there may be some glitches. Uh, whether or not FERPA in a narrow interpretation would actually apply? I'm not so sure because FERPA speaks to the release of an educational record, mm -hmm. uh, which participating in a Google Classroom is not a record. Um, it's not a hard artifact uh, that a district has inappropriately released. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would also just underscore at least my interpretation of FERPA is that it does not create um, an individually enforceable right on behalf of a particular student. I might have that wrong, um, but I, am I right on that, Celine? I, 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 so I would not see FERPA as being um, a barrier to moving forward with providing educational continuity through an electronic device. Yeah. Also, the Office for Civil Rights has issued um, discretionary enforcement policies in this time um, regarding HIPAA, regarding the use of Zoom, regarding the use of FaceTime. Um, so I, the, I, I was just looking, those bulletins are, are on our website too. So there, you know, there's been some attempt um, by um, the Office for Civil Rights to address some of these concerns. For FERPA though, I thought you had to have a policy or practice that was violating the privacy rights. Uh, I don't see how FERPA is violated, but um, I've only done one FERPA case, so that maybe I'm not the right person. Um, yeah. I had a CPAC um, chair ask me to review a document that is typically provided to all parents at the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. um, allowing for your child's mm -hmm. name or information to be put in the newspaper or a video to be taken right. or whatever, and asking me if that would apply to something like Google Classroom. Um, and I took a look at it and uh, the, the language seemed to me to be able to be interpreted rather broadly because they had it broken down into sort of public media versus private media, meaning private media, those things that would go around the school for, for instructional purposes. Um, and it would seem to me that Google Classroom would be covered there. My suggestion was, you know, they can just have parents sign a new one um, for Google Classroom. Um, it seemed to make sense to me. Um, Oh, this is a good one. Will video recordings be a part of a student's educational records? Hmm. I think that might have been in um, answer to, or in response to Celine's talking about videoing your child, mm -hmm. um, present level, your present level. I, I think parents are, per, are permitted to provide materials for the child's school record. That would be a, an example of it. Um, was this questioner maybe talking about the, a Google Classroom video or a video like from by the ch by the parent or even by a service provider in one on one setting? Yes, that's. Or are they asking, you know, is this discoverable? If um, these are being mm -hmm. recorded, um, do we then have that record as to what the education was that the student was getting during that time? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that that's certainly discoverable. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Go ahead. Yeah, one question that I had uh, yesterday was whether or not a family can videotape the classes as they're going on. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at what your consent laws are. If you've got a two-party consent state, like Maryland is two-party consent state, you have to have the explicit consent of the other party to record those um, sessions. So. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be careful on that kind of recording of those sessions. Um, and yeah. that would be why <clears throat> if school districts wanted to record them, they just need to send out a notice and right. get a new signature. Right. Um, it shouldn't be a no, we can't provide live sessions because if we provide live sessions, then some students who can't make it to that appointed time will miss out. So that is why we can only provide pre-recorded videos. And my response to that was, well, you can continue to provide your pre-recorded videos, you can provide the live sessions, and you can record the live sessions so that the student has access, access to that. Um, also, my research on um, providing the live, what they call synchronous um, mm -hmm. <laughs> learning opportunities, is that those synchronous learning opportunities have a couple of advantages. One is they provide for a class discussion. Um, they provide for um, what they call you know, collaborative learning. It's not just a lecture like in a video. 
Um, and two, they also provide for um, the social interaction with uh, their, uh, their classmates mm -hmm. um, when they're seeing, at least they're seeing their, all, all their pictures. They're having a discussion back and forth. Uh, and the third that I thought was important in this uh, research that I read is that the synchronous learning provides an increase in motivation mm -hmm. for students. That's what they found in the study that they had done. And I have learn, learned uh, many comments that, gee, kids aren't really showing up, they're not doing the videos, the this, the that. Motivation is a big issue right now. Right. And how are we going to motivate kids to sit in front of their laptop um, and listen to their teacher? Right. Um, so I think that that's, that's important when arguing that there should be at least uh, that synchronous learning as a hybrid with the asynchronous offerings. Um, Okay, the school district of my client offers one hour a day of instruction through an iPad and wants my Spanish speaking client to use her iPhone to provide two more hours of instruction. They were also supposed to provide outside OT and ELA evaluations that must be done in person. To make matters worse, my client's son is graduating middle school at the end of May. Any advice? Uh, well, if the child, I, I'm assuming the child has an IEP or is being, I mean, because. The OT yeah, and the ELA evaluation. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, hopefully child has, an, because the IDA is really clear. Um, things must be provided at no cost to the parent. Mm -hmm. Using the parent's iPhone for two hours a day is a cost and uh, school should shoot a little iPad, even a little iPad mini uh, on over to have those extra two hours. With regard to those therapy or those evaluations, I really would want to delve in. There are not that many areas that we can't do evaluation via distance. There are a few, uh, certainly behavior in the classroom, um, ability to walk between classes, <laughs> um, crossing busy streets. The streets aren't that busy right now. There are some, definitely. But OT, a whole heck of a lot of it's going to be doable via distance. Now the OT might need to have a uh, an assessment box put together, send it to the drop it off at the parents' um, door, drop off some sanitary cloths or whatever, whatever you need to do, or some Lysol spray in it, whatever. But we can do this. But my thought on that um, was regarding evaluations and getting a blanket no from your school district mm -hmm. that we're not going to do any evaluations during this time of school closure. You know, we're working on providing um, some, some learning opportunities that will provide <laughs> enrichment to your child, but the last thing they're going to be doing is evaluations. And um, in one case that I'm working on, the family who, who was um, scheduling a private evaluation anyway had been in contact with their private evaluator and their private evaluator said, well, you know, I'm going to be opening up to do some minimal evaluating at this time. Um, yeah, we can yeah. do as much as, it, as we can over Zoom. Mm -hmm. There are things that we have to do in person, so maybe we can work out how we can do that. And so my response um, to the school district was, well, if your staff isn't available to be able to do these, <laughs> then why don't you jump on board with our private evaluation now um, and cost share it with the family? Um, you know, how are we going to get this evaluation done? Um, and that to me seemed to be the goal. Uh, if a child's treating physician prescribes or orders home instruction for a child, must the school district provide an instructor to come to the child's home even in the midst of school closures? My answer is no. My answer is um, the question might be blending um, instruction in the home, which is an IDEA placement program IEP team decision mm -hmm. with, at least in Pennsylvania, and I'll only speak in this jurisdiction, is a provision in actually the school, uh, the Pennsylvania school code in the section of attendance dealing with homebound instruction. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with IDEA. 
So I would want to know a little more information as to which of the two the physician has in mind. Uh, it might be that uh, if it is homebound instruction, because that doesn't have an IDEA attachment, um, it's not a function of an IEP. Um, and, and understanding a little bit more about why the doctor is making that mm -hmm. recommendation would mm -hmm. be something I want to know. Instruction in the home, on the other hand, which is an IDEA placement, as a result of the disability, this child cannot be in school to receive his or her FAPE. I think that would have to be something that was discussed in an IEP capacity, but we're all at home. So what does that actually look like in terms of physically sending a teacher outside the door, standing, you know, ringing your doorbell? I don't believe that an IEP team over, you know, a governor's closure can, can circumvent that. But again, as we've said throughout this session, technology could be a key uh, in order to get that instruction to the child. Um, but I would want to know whether this was a homebound instruction conversation or an instruction in the home conversation. Thank you, Kim. Let's see. Um, will there be a waiver of challenging the comprehensive evaluations during this time if we don't do it in per, whoops. I just lost it. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, there it goes. It's back. Will there be a waiver of challenging the comprehensive evaluations during this time if we don't do it in person? Is it better to just wait or what are guiding question, what guiding questions should be considered? From my point of view, I don't I don't know why it would be good to wait necessarily unless unless it, we are assessing things that can't be assessed via distance. Um, honestly, again, this, this is another one of Carlton's silver linings, but it's kind of nice to get, let's get some data. Let's get some information about how, what's going on in the home instruction area. And then when we go back, we can see how things change. Uh, I, I tend to like more information rather than less information. So I'm not sure that anything is really to be gained by doing no, not even trying to do an evaluation at this time. Uh, here, here's one regarding a transition. In cases of preschool evaluation going into kindergarten, what could evaluation look like to establish about eligibility for a specific learning disability or communication impairment. I am an educational diagnostician and face-to-face -face evaluation could be done during the summer, but we are trying to think outside of the box in my district for right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some sort of, similar to what Carlton was describing, um, some sort of online assessment could be done. Um, that's one thought. A second thought, and I've uh, had a, converse, a number of conversations with neuropsychologists in and around southeastern Pennsylvania, and consistent with social distancing, they are doing a combination of online assessment, but they are also doing face-to-face. Um, -face. They are using plexiglass screen um, so that they can maintain a distance um, with between evaluator and, um, and student. So I would think that there would be ways to get, in air quote, eyes on kids um, for purposes of assessment and have them complete certain uh, aspects of, hand, of, of written assessment, uh, whether or not the protocols for those testing um, assessments are maintained you know you want to make sure obviously that a parent is not in the room and and i think that's up to the professional though in terms of how they are going to maintain consistency with a with a testing protocol but from related service providers and neuropsychologists i have had experience with both those groups um, figuring out alternatives to keep things moving forward for kids 
Thank you. Um, here's the next question. In California, we are seeing issues with foster youth with disabilities at risk of losing their placements because their family no longer has respite through the school. These are youth who might require one-on-one -on -one aids when they are in school. Thoughts about what to do for these vulnerable youth. Interesting. So they're, they're talking about the respite being the period of time when the child is usually in school. With right. Their aid. So I am not, obviously I am not licensed in California. I stick to my, my place in PA. Um, my best advice is to try to engage on an interagency level because mm -hmm. I think it's a really great point that foster mom, foster dad uh, are there and have been there for the child, but 6.75 hours a day, that child was in school, that now is flipping to home. And from a behavioral health perspective, from a mental health perspective, additional support is needed. Um, I would think that there could be some interagency resources that could be brought to bear to that situation. And, I, and IDEA speaks to interagency collaboration uh, around mixed needs of education, behavioral health, and mental health. So that's, that's a pathway I might think about pursuing. But again, saying I'm not in California. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the students who could experience a crisis and then be unnecessarily psychiatrically hospitalized during this time um, is a tremendous concern of mine. Um, those, I mean, there are a lot of vulnerable students um, right now, but students who have already suffered trauma in their lives um, are particularly vulnerable right now. So, I because the danger could be that they would be unnecessarily hospitalized. And that's a very, very restrictive um, um, setting for, for a, a student. Um, I would agree with what Kim said and, and look at interagency um, resources to assist. One other thought that I had is that at least in Massachusetts, it is my understanding that um, Behavioral health providers, those who like a BCBA um, or an, um, an assistant are considered essential workers. Mm -hmm. And despite the um, state of emergency and the closure of non-essential workplaces, that at least private um, companies who provide ABA services in the home are still doing so. Um, and I thought that that was important um, information to be had and maybe in some way that would relate um, to what's going on. We're gonna have one last question. Um, I wanna pick the best one. Okay. Um, I had the IEP meeting at the beginning of March. Next day I asked for mediation. I haven't received the IEP yet, and I haven't heard from the mediator either. What should I do? If the question is coming from Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> all dispute resolution processes remain intact, meaning hearing officers are convening. Um, that being said, the office that coordinates all of that activity is working remotely um, and March is sort of the the uh, the point in time in which all of this started to happen my best advice if again if this is Pennsylvania would be for that individual to reach out to the Office of Dispute Resolution mm -hmm. to um, advise that a mediation request was submitted on you know blank date and to ask for a case manager at the Office of Dispute Resolution to assist and facilitate assignment to the mediator. It might very well be, given the timing of when that mediation request came in, that something got lost in the sauce, either at um, the scheduling level 
or the when a party requests mediation again in Pennsylvania, the LEA has to be notified and has to agree. And so that LEA decision on whether or not it wanted to participate, that could be sitting in somebody's email queue and it just didn't get responded to. So in Pennsylvania, I would recommend shaking the tree and reminding the Office of Dispute Resolution um, that this request had been made. And, and if you have to resubmit the request to get it moving forward. And here in Massachusetts, um, I, I certainly would give similar advice. In addition, that it, if there's really no response um, from the mediation office, is to reach out to you know, a handful of other um, state offices that are offering to step in to help. You know, we have program quality assurance with the problem resolution system. Um, there is, you know, the, the Office for Children is also offering to step in to help mediate problems. So it would be, I would say, to reach out to any of those and maybe they can get in touch with the mediation office and find out what's going on and why they're not moving forward. All right, um, thank you very much, everyone. It looks like we've gotten to 2.31, so we're over our time. Uh, I really appreciate um, all of the panelists today. You've done a great job and have given out terrific information. I also appreciate the over a thousand people who had tuned in today. Uh, I think that that is really um, telling of the level of importance that we now attribute in the legal community to the special education needs of children with disabilities. And to me, that's quite heartening um, to know that um, how important that is um, in the legal community these days. I wanted to end with one um, final quote. Um, After Bernie Sanders endorsed Joe Biden over live streamed video, Jimmy Kimmel said, that's a very powerful message for the country. If two 80-year-old men can su successfully log into a Zoom meeting, anything <laughs> is possible. <laughs> Very nice. That's great. So on that note, um, anything is possible. That's right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Be safe, be well, and be kind. Same. Thank you. Take care.